first ever Makli International Conference organized by Department of uh, Culture and Tourism and Antiquities and Endowment Fund Trust for the preservation of uh, the heritage of Sin. May I request Dr. Ruth Jung to please uh, join us on stage. May I request Dr. Thomas Lauren to please join us on stage. Mr. Shayan Rajani to please uh, join us on stage. Dr. Walid Zaid to please join us on stage. May I request Dr. Ghulam Mohammad Lakho to please come on stage and join us. First of all, we have uh, Munazza Akhtar uh, from Canada uh, who will be on uh, Skype, available on Skype, uh, talking on uh, uh, the topic. Munazza Akhtar, uh, let me tell you about her. She received master's uh, degree in architecture, thesis research on contemporary trends in the architecture of Pakistan in uh, 2009. She worked as a lecturer in the Department of Architecture University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore, before joining AHVS as a doctoral student in 2012. Her research interests include Islamic uh, uh, funerary archi uh, architecture, cross-cultural issues in Islamic art and architecture of South Asia, and British period architecture in present-day India and Pakistan. Her doctoral dissertation uh, titles, Interrogating uh, the Dead Resuming the Cultural Identities, the Necropolis of uh, Makli focuses on the study of architectural monuments built during the Sama uh, dynasty, which was uh, from 1351 to 1524 in Sin. To found her research, she has been received the uh, University of uh, Victoria Doctoral Student Fellowship in 2012 to tw uh, 2014, the University of Oxford. Barakat Trust Award in 2014 and IANH Stewart Graduate Student Fellowship in 20, uh, five, 2015 to 2016 at the Center of Studies in Religion and Society. Uh, uh, besides with that, uh, let me include that currently she holds uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada SSHRC Doctoral Fellowship from 20, 2015 to 2017. Uh, the initial topic which was uh, assigned to uh, Munazza Akhtar was uh, Sama Trade Network, Art and Architecture of Sama Period. But there is uh, some change in the topic. So we have with us uh, Munazza Akhtar live on Skype from Canada. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together this much anticipated event. Unfortunately, it was not possible for me to travel at this time. Therefore, I'm even more grateful for this opportunity to participate from Canada. Um, my talk is based on some ideas I'm exploring in my doctoral dissertation. My interest in the trade networks of 15th century Sin departed with much enthusiasm upon reading an article published in the Journal of Pakistan Historical Society in 1991, indicating the presence of traders from Dewal transacting in Jeddah when Sindh was ruled by Sama Jam Sanjar. I should specify that the name of the pre-Islamic settlement Debel remained in use even after its decline around the 13th century and was used in connection to Tata and its seaport in various late medieval and early modern textual sources. I was mainly trying to locate Tata's global position in the wider geographic region during the Sama dynastic period, aiming that these mercantile connections will support in determining the visual and stylistic frameworks in which the Sama architectural artifacts were conceived. So coming back to the article, the author quotes Ibn Majid, an Arab navigator from Oman, reporting about an extraordinary black Egyptian horse bought by the traders from Debel for a large sum at a market in Jeddah. On examining the original source, I was disappointed to discover that Ibn Majid was talking about the traders of Dabhol, the port in present Maharashtra, further southeast on the Indian coast. Although the Arab navigator has mentioned Sin several times in his nautical treatises, but not once has mentioned the capital city of Tata or any port town of Sin. I later discovered that the same follows in other contemporary Arab and European travelogues, maps, and texts. Maritime as well as interregional trade under the Samas is just as obscure as the rest of the accounts and accomplishments of this dynasty. Samas were indigenous people settled in Sindh for centuries. They came to power in the mid-14th century, initially serving as subservient to the Delhi sultans and eventually asserting their independence with the collapse of the Sultanate. The Samas ruled Sindh till the, till the Turco-Mongol Argoons overpowered them in 1521. 
Summers made Thatha the capital of Sin, and it remained so for centuries. The historic city was a unique geopolitical entity. It was a thriving center of commercial activities being located on the crossroads from Persia, Central Asia, and rest of India, serving as a river port sited at the apex of Indus Delta. Therefore, it is hard to imagine that having such a strategically located emporia in its possession for more than one and a half century, the Sama dynasty had existed in a vacuum without any commercial connections. I believe using the stray items of information from contemporary foreign documents and reassessing the architecture of their extant monuments, the mercantile culture and alliances of the Samas can be reasonably comprehended. Historical accounts on the Samas still suffer from numerous uncertainties. We already know the reason being that between Chachnama of the 13th century and tarikh e masumi of the early 17th century, there's a gap in contemporary historic sources from Sin. Therefore, for their identities, we have to actively engage with architecture, epigraphy, and decoration on, the, on their monuments, now mainly preserved on the northeast of Makhli Hill. Scholars classify Makhli through the lens of its Muslim religious orientation, generally classifying its monuments under singular polarities, categorizing them as Islamic, Indo-Muslim, or Sindhi Islamic. In this paper, I will look at a few monuments patronized by the Samas and talk about their peculiar features. I will demonstrate that these Sama monuments on Makli Hill lay claim to several geographic regions and cultures, and in doing so, not only reflect Tatha's medieval position, but also the cultural identities of the Samas. Jam Tamachi, the third Sama Sultan, is credited to laying the foundation of the necropolis and cultural center on Makli Hill. On his ascent to the throne, he patronized the Jame Masjid and the Khanka for Sheikh Hamad Jamal, a Suharwardi Khalifa who had reasonable influence over the political events and destiny of the realm. Towards the end of the 14th century, these were the earliest permanent structures built on Makli Hill. Both structures are diverse not only in their style, but also their construction and decorative techniques. The existing state of the brick mosque indicates a vaulted rectangular structure having pointed lofty arches and limited decoration with modest mukarnas, niches, and geometric recessions in stucco finish. The mosque displays a humble connection with the Persianate building traditions from the west, which were already well established in the Indus Valley and can be seen in the medieval monuments of Uch and Multan. However, the Khanka noticeably represents the expertise of Sama builders in diverse building practices. Although not a well-preserved structure, it is possible to reconstruct its image with the help of material lying in situ. Thus, the Khanka was a square chamber with 12 stone pillars, all engaged with three armed capitals to support the roof above. The outer faces of the pillars were plain, while the inner faces have several intricately carved motifs, dividing each monolithic shaft into segments. A curtain wall of large stone blocks fitted with carved window screens enclosed the chamber. For the pieces lying around, it is from the pieces lying around, it is conceivable that resting above the ring beam was a carbon dome built of overlapping concentric courses of stone rings. There is no foundational inscription on the Khanka, but Quranic verses carved on the lintels and door jams in high relief support its use for meditation and celebration of the divine. The quality of craftsmanship seems to have fluctuated with specific components. Where the columns show sophistication and mastery in carving skills, the epigraphy lacks the same refinement. Later structures built around the Khanka with similar architectural and decorative vocabulary took the form of open polygonal pavilions called chhatris. And assuming that Dr. Kalhoro must have explained them yesterday, I'm not going to go in their details. However, the, that the Khanka and the Chhatris were constructed in indigenous architectural traditions is evident from the ruins of Thumbanwadi Mosque, a 12th century structure located some distance from Makli on the coast. The stone carved pillars of this mosque also employ similar decorative vocabulary. All these structures exhibit a morphological connection to the Maru Gujara style of temple architecture, geographically identified with Western Indian states of Gujarat and Rajasthan. For instance, the Chhatris represent appropriation of mandapas, which were open pillared halls for theatrical performances in medieval temples. The Marugushra style of temples was itself a consolidation of two independent ancient styles. It was gradually crafted and reached its maturity under the patronage of Chalakya rulers of Gujarat and Rajasthan. On becoming the most widely used and patronized style of the regions, 
east of Sindh, after the arrival of Islam in Gujarat, Maru Gujra style was adopted even for religious buildings used by the Muslim communities of Gujarat. Additionally, the 12th century Thumbanwadi Mosque indicates the builders of Sindh were also familiar with the style for centuries. Furthermore, although we do not find any existing prototypes for the Khanka of Hama Jamal in the vicinity of Tatha or elsewhere in Sindh, but beyond Sindh, the Shrine of Ibrahim, a 12th century monument in Padreshwar on the coast of Kutch, is a very close model. Both the Makli Khanka and the Kutch Shrine are similar in many characteristics, from their building dimensions to, state, to details of specific elements. On the same site and elsewhere in Kutch, models for the Sama Chhatris are also found. Perhaps the most significant and compelling example to engage with the traditions of Maru Gurjara Ambed and iconography is the tomb of Sultan Nizam al-Din Jam Nanda, designed more than a century after the Khanka towards the end of the dynastic rule. The tomb was built putting the archaic system of construction to trial, using stone instead of the familiar trabeate system. It is indeed a fusion of diverse styles, occupying a commanding place within the Sama group. In its extensive decorative program, the tomb is laden with symbolism and allegorical clues. At first glance, the tomb does represent a confused mixture of countless elements, but it has a carefully drafted artistic program with an underlying theme. Let me highlight just a few elements. The tomb is pierced with doorways on three sides. The one on the west, which seems to be the main entrance, is not centered. Mandaraka, the projecting semicircular stone used in temples to sacralize the threshold, is present at all entrances. These mandarakas have a half lotus, Ardha Padma, on top, flanked by smaller ones on both sides. Lotus in Hindu mythology represents good fortune and prosperity, both material and spiritual. Epigraphy on the lintel and door frame consists of foundational inscriptions in Arabic, Quranic verses addressing non-Muslims, invite them on the true path, equating the tomb to the gateway of paradise and promising rewards for believers in their life after death. This tomb is the strongest evidence we have referring to the Sama genealogy, as the foundational inscriptions provide lineage of the Sultan right up to the founder of the dynasty. The most outstanding feature of the tomb are on the west facade. Between various decorative bands, there is a frieze of Hamza, the geese, in procession holding twi twigs in their mouth. Goose is a Buddhist emblem, later incorporated into Hindu iconography. In Hindu temples, Brahma is often shown soaring on his glorious male goose once his soul became free from the bondage of rebirth. Such zoomorphic imagery was also featured earlier in Muslim ritual buildings of Western India. For example, the frieze of Hamsa in the interior of early 13th century mosque at Khattu in Rajasthan. Another important feature in the middle of the west facade is the mihrab projection in the form of an extravagantly ornamented device. This device is also an appropriation of the standard elevation feature from Maru Gujra temples, known as Mandovara. Mandovaras were well, were well developed by the 11th century and were usually loaded with iconic imagery. When Muslims in Gujarat adopted them mainly as external projections to mehrabs, the figures were omitted. The Mandovara of Jam Nizam's tomb is also an iconic, but its use itself is unique in sin. Its lower its lowest part displays moldings and arched panels, while the middle part is adorned with carved pillarets with a mehrab niche in the center where, in temples, large figures were placed. The bell-shaped miniature shikaras topped by fluted discs amalakas are placed at the corners, which in temples symbolize the presence of a deity. Above this part comes a combination of various elements, serpent, including serpentine brackets, crowned with a projecting balcony. Thus, this apparently chaotic decorative program, drawing from Hindu, Jain, Buddhist, and Islamic cultural repertoires, asserts an, uh, asserts an underlying theme of spiritual enlightenment. It also declares the accomplishment of the human soul along with the divinity and immortality of the Sultan, which in indigenous terms was called Moksha. Moksha represents the release from the cycle of samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and reincarnation that the Sultan supposedly attained. Thus, by placing the Sama monuments in a broader geographic and cultural framework, their Sindhi and Islamic identity becomes problematic. The regional boundaries during this period also appear to be much more fluid. 
even if the territories were divided into distinct dynastic domains. Movement of artistic ideas from Kutch, Gujarat, and Rajasthan into Sindh are easy to understand when commercial, social, and ethnic links between these regions are taken into account. Historical texts signify that the Sama spread as a nation did not remain confined to Sindh. One branch of Hindu Sama pastoralists was settled in Sindh since the 8th century, and another moved to Kutch in the 12th century. In the 9th century, a third branch relocated to Gujarat later founding the Chuda Sama dynasty of Junagar. Those of the Sama tribe who, tribe who remained in Sin eventually became Muslims and went on to rebel against the Sultans of Delhi and the Sumras. We also need to consider that following its Muslim conquest, Sin underwent a gradual cultural and religious transformation from Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism, passing through heterodox Ismailism to eventually adopting Sunnism at the hands of Sufi saints. This process, which transpired over centuries, gave birth to an integrated culture, a culture of adaptability and tolerance in Sin, where Hindus had affiliations to Muslim peers and where Brahmins taught Muslims. These traditions were deeply embedded into the culture of Sin by the time Samas came to power. The Samas, regardless of living in different domains and following diverse religions, in general remained a tolerant race equally honoring Hinduism and Islam, and often found in history to be uniting in kinsman support. Long established conduits of commercial exchange and human migration existed between multiple cities of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Kutch, and Sindh, and were frequently traveled since before the arrival of the Arabs. Although we do not find mention of a bustling seaport for Tatta during the Sama period, yet the Portuguese documents do mention a few coastal settlements linking Tatta to several port towns of Western India through coastal trade. Furthermore, to strengthen these links, by the, la by the latter half of the 15th century, Samas had also formed marital alliances with the Gujarati Sultans and the Faruqis of Khandesh, thus asserting their in uh, intangible spread more widely in the western parts of the Indian subcontinent. However, at the same time, a shift appears in these connections, especially during the reign of Jam Nizam al -Din. We also find Tata gradually expanding its link towards the western regions as well, brought into closer contact with cultural centers like Shiraz, Hirat, Kabul, and Samarkand. Tata further refined its intellectual productivity and commerce. In contemporary texts, we find incidental accounts on trade from Sindh with the regions on the west. The merchants from Sindh are found in profitable business with the regions as far as the boundaries of northwest Iran. From Tata, Fluvial and land routes connected to Kabul, Kandahar, and Samarkand via Multan and Lahore. In the wake of these connections, we see the transformation in scripts, where Arabic was used exclusively in the early Sama monuments. Persian appears in the epigraphy on the later monuments. Another feature is the use of social and gender identity markers, such as headgears on the cenotaphs. Generally recognized as an Ottoman feature, this is a Central Asian ins inspiration as the Samas continued their alliances with the Mongols, which they had formed in the second half of the 14th century against the Delhi Sultans. Use of these headgears in the form of fluted crowns and ornate turbans extended beyond the royal necropolis as well, as evident from a cenotaph in the Rasvadio graveyard southwest of Makli. They do, however, express the gender and status of social privilege for Sama nobles, especially useful where the inscriptions are absent. With the fall of the Samas, rule of the indigenous people ended in Sin. However, the cultural landscape of Makli was developed further by three following dynasties. Yet, none of the later dynastic structures draw from the indigenous Indic cultures or present cultural fusions as distinctly as the Sama artifacts. Monuments built on Makli Hill range from Baradaris to steppels and from mosques to Makbaras, Madrasas, Khankas and temples. With the Muslims used to gather here on the call of prayers, historic textual sources confirm that the Hindu sannyasis and bhagats also used the sacred space to recite chants in their temples. It was also a space that became the melting pot of artistic ideas brought from east, west, and north, displaying different forms of connections and alliances of each ruling dynasty. So having such diversity in the monuments, their style, and views, how can we define a site like Makli with monolithic identities? It becomes questionable when terms such as Muslim, Indic, or Sindhi 
restricted by specific religious and geographic boundaries are used. It is even more problematic as these fail to acknowledge the complexities of intercultural interactions and undermine our understanding of South Asian artifacts and sites, which, as some monuments show, concurrently represent multiple cultures, regions, and religions. Thank you. Dr. Thomas Lorraine will be talking on uh, the topic of uh, funerary complex of uh, Khaja Sabz Posh in uh, Bamiyan, Afghanistan. But let me introduce Dr. Thomas Lorraine. Dr. Thomas Lorraine holds a doctorate from uh, Ecole uh, Pratik Des Hots Attitudes, EPHE, with a dissertation on medieval military architecture in Southeast uh, Antolia. He has taken part in numerous uh, archaeological missions as an archaeologist or draftsman uh, topographer in France, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey and Uzbekistan. His area of exp expertise is uh, especially it focuses on mainly on art, archaeology, history and Islamic architecture, especially in the Turkish and Persian worlds. He is also interested in the history of construction techniques from 2012 to 2017, last year, Dr. Lauren was the deputy director of the French Delegation of Archaeology in Afghanistan, DAFA, and has conducted excavations uh, of various Afghan archaeological sites such as uh, Herat Mosala, uh, the No uh, Gumbad Mosque, which is Haji Piala, which is also called Haji Piala in Balkh, and uh, Shehre uh, uh, Galgosha in Bayman and uh, he's also uh, uh, familiar with uh, the excavation of uh, Afghanistan and uh, the near uh, areas of Afghanistan. He's also involved in the Afghanistan archaeological map project and the training of uh, young Afghan archaeologists. Since, uh, since uh, uh, 2015, he has been responsible for the Frenso Afghan archaeological mission in Bayman, uh, which was called MA. FAB, supported by the uh, Consultative Commission for the Archaeological Research Abroad of the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, whose aim is the study of Islamic monuments and archaeological sites in the Bayman Valleys. Uh, let me repeat again that he will be talking on his uh, paper. The topic of his paper is Funerary Complex of Khaja Subsposh in Bayman, Afghanistan. Please welcome Dr. Thomas Lorraine. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, like everyone, and it's totally deserved, I'd like to, to thank the Culture, Tourism and Antiquities Department for the invitation together with the EFT. And really, uh, it's really an honor and I'm really grateful to be, to be here today. Today, I will not speak about Makli. I will not speak about uh, Sindh. I will not speak about Pakistan. But I come as a neighbor and I would like to uh, introduce some of the, the works I'm doing in Afghanistan not giving you uh, results of research and uh, dates and so on, I will give you some, but more uh, to share with you my experience as an archaeologist uh, working on the World Heritage uh, site, classified as a um, uh, site uh, on, the, um, what's the name, uh, when they almost destroy and will finish by being destroyed, I forgot the name, I'm sorry, in English. Uh, so. I will speak about Bamiyan, and Bamiyan is mostly known for its Buddhist heritage, and, but it's also, it was also the capital of the Hurid period, and before that, the Hasnevid were very uh, active in the region. So my project, the project I'm leading since 2014, uh, consists of a large survey of the monumental and archaeological sites uh, remaining uh, from the Islamic period in the valleys of Bamiyan. So I will present one, of the ex one example of those sites, the funerary complex, or the so-called funerary complex of Khwaja Sabz Push in Bamiyan, and try to show uh, in the meantime the, the, the problem that we can face as an archaeologist in the World Heritage Site. So first of all, I, will, I have a lot of slides, but I will, I will go fast. Uh, Bamiyan is in the Indukush Mountains of Afghanistan, um, somehow 250 kilometers far from Kabul. Here you have a, a view of the valley with a, a different site uh, already, uh, already discovered, in Islamic site already discovered in the valley, and which were most of them absolutely not known because everyone is focusing on the Buddhist period. 
And I would like to emphasize especially on the, on the shrines. There's, I found almost 20 shrines in, in the valley around the, the center of Bamiyan. Uh, most of them uh, are partly destroyed. And I will focus on, on those one here uh, in the Foladi Valley. Here's uh, our old view with, uh, with uh, some sketches uh, representing the, the, the monument. So we have basically uh, five uh, centered monuments with a cupola. One is totally destroyed on the north. Uh, one is here on the other side of the road. And I'm more interested in this area, the green area, which is now a cemetery. So this is uh, what looks like a Roger Sasbuch monument. And the cemetery is in front, as you see here. The site has been uh, not totally rediscovered, but uh, at least restored uh, by Ecomos Germany in uh, 2012. Uh, it was really the first time that someone was interested in the Islamic uh, heritage of Bamiyan, and they decided to restore those uh, three of the, of the monuments of the Roger Sasbuch uh, complex necropolis, especially two, uh, two square buildings. And here starts uh, the good news and the bad news. The good news is someone is taking care about Islamic monuments. The bad news is before starting any restoration, nobody calls architects, uh, nobody calls any archaeologist or Islamic historian to make a survey of the site before the restoration. And what I will say is, of course, uh, a little bit against the, the way uh, UNESCO organized the work there, and absolutely not against the restorator who just made his work is a, is a very good uh, restorator and a very good friend. So to restore a building, first they have to excavate and to dig up uh, down to the foundations. So let's say that all the archaeological evidence uh, connecting the surrounding with the monuments are totally lost. And uh, we just have, and we are really fortunate to have this uh, restorator. The restorator kept every uh, pieces of, uh, of ceramics, of paper, and uh, stucco he found on site. So the site was full of pieces of stucco, and lots of um, manuscripts, pieces of manuscripts inside, and some shreds of, of ceramics. Problem is totally out of context. We know approximately where does it come from, but we have no idea about the uh, stratigraphical, archaeological context of this discovery. So like I said, I will focus especially on two, two, two of the so-called shrines. Uh, so it's two square buildings. Uh, linked by a wall, open by the door. Uh, there's a small room, quite weird. Um, I think the, the, the researcher didn't know what to do with that on the north side, and two small towers on the edges. The, the, western, uh, the western building is uh, totally lost its cupola, so we cannot have a, a clear view of what it was, except by using the symmetry, because the, the eastern one is, is exactly the same uh, than the first one. So you see inside, uh, we are not in Makli. We don't have uh, stone architecture. Everything is made of uh, pebble for foundation and mud brick and uh, parsa uh, for the walls. So don't expect very nice, incredible, uh, precise uh, uh, sculpture. But you will see they, they can manage things. So we have a square building with a round cupola, and the connection between the square and uh, the circle is made by squinches, which have, uh, as you can see here, some clumsy uh, mukana. So we are in remote parts of the valley, and I'm here we, we can say that the architects are not really familiar with the uh, mukana's uh, building. Decoration consists also of uh, niches with lots of molding, on inside and outside also. Here's a, a, small, uh, a small molding coming from a, a niche uh, remaining from the, the wall separating the, linking the, the two buildings. So my fir the first step was to come back on this monument, restored, and try to think, to, 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 to understand what was original and what was restoration. It was quite easy, but uh, what I found is that the researcher missed a lot of information. First, in the, in the niches, on the top of the, uh, of the middle wall uh, entrance, uh, the niches were totally to all covered with inscription. Uh, inscription carved in the, in, the in, the, in the mud. And also not only inscription, but also some uh, decorative uh, uh, elements, uh, molding and sculpture 
again uh, sculpt in the in the mud and the straw. So uh, with my team and uh, a specialist of epigraphy, we we could we managed to find some some information about the inscription and. Unfortunately, we never had any dates or any proper name, but still we have a kind of a funerary uh, a classical inscription on the, on the top of this, uh, this niche. What the, the, the restorator found also is a lot of inscription made by, uh, in stucco. And again, it was just stored in, uh, in a storage room and we work uh, like make a, a giant puzzle to, to try to understand uh, how it was organized and, uh, and if there's any meaning. So here we have parts of a name and you can see how it was looking like. And so we have Kufik before and now a Nasri inscription. Uh, the problem is that we don't know exactly where it comes from on the monuments. So it could be in the entrance, it could be on the, on the inside. There's no evidence. The only information it gave us is stylistic evidence, so we can make comparison with other, other pieces of uh, stucco we, we know from other, other regions or other uh, monuments. Like here, for example, we have uh, something coming from Afraseab in Uzbekistan, and here's something from uh, Harir in Iran, dated between the 12th and uh, 11th century, presenting the same kind of, uh, of uh, letters and same kind of kufik with uh, this line uh, on each uh, side of the letters. Also, the, um, the decoration of the, of the Nasr uh, looks like pretty much another site uh, around 200 kilometers far from, uh, from Bamiyan in Danestama. It was excavated in the, in the 60s by a French archaeologist from the Dafa. And here it, it belongs to this Danestama building, which is probably a madrasa, as we will see uh, later. So we have uh, a stucco in, uh, inscription and decoration and also paintings inside the monuments. First, when we came, restorators said, oh, the paintings are probably from the 15, uh, 16, 17, 20th century, it's totally new. And again, uh, 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 Dr. Sandra Aub, she, she came and, and she specialized in the, in the uh, architectural decoration. And uh, we start to, to, to look for um, comparison to make. And, we, we found some, uh, especially here in the squinch of the Madrasa Zialdin of Yazd, uh, dated from the, 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 the 13th century. And also we can find the same kind of, uh, of a spiral of um, uh, intricate uh, decoration inside the, uh, in, the, in the ceramic, cluster ceramic. From here I have two examples uh, from Iranian ceramic from kept in the Louvre Museum, but there's many, many others. So by the side we can come to uh, some information uh, for the dating. But it was not enough and so we decided to, to make an excavation on the site. And it was not, like I explained, uh, really easy because the connection between the surroundings and the site were totally uh, cut by the restorators. Nevertheless, we work on this area. And first thing, we saw that there's a big trench and it's not only uh, the researcher who has to blame, who, who must be blamed, but also looters. And in fact, in 2001, uh, someone very important in Bamiyan decided that he was uh, uh, entitled to excavate the site and use a, a bulldozer to remove uh, parts of the site. Nobody knows what he found, nobody knows what happened, but he destroyed, uh, what we, he destroyed a large part of the site. So here's an aerial view of the of the excavation, and we perform excavation in, in four different areas. At, but I will uh, emphasize especially on the building here. So here, a closer example of what we found. So the two uh, so-called shrines, two uh, uh, funerary buildings were not alone. In fact, it was a much bigger uh, monument and not two square building, but a large square uh, complex, let's say. I will come back on that later. And we found also a lot of ceramics. Here again, uh, the restorator work, the looters work, uh, mix, mix up everything, but we know that we have uh, a potter workshop connected to the building. So also we can date, uh, we can date the building with uh, a style, uh, the style of ceramic, but also we are now waiting for some samples we send to, to date the remaining of the, those workshops. So you have a, a pieces of a kiln here and some uh, uh, ceramics, overcooked ceramics, which collapse in the kiln. So we are sure that we have uh, not just a funerary complex, but also the workshop here. 
here's what we found, the, the plan of what we found, and you can see that uh, everything was destroyed here. It's because of the bulldozer, but we can find uh, the limit, other, all the pieces of the, of the walls and of the building. Uh, and here, there's some uh, reconstruction of those, uh, those rooms. So basically, you have here two square rooms with the main entrance, with an I1, E1 on the, on the entrance, and another E1 leading to a courtyard, which is open to room around the courtyard with another E1 in the axis of the entrance. So the, the building starts to be more and more complex. Here's some um, yeah, kind of a restitution I made to, to better understand the, the shape of the building. So this is from the entrance and from the other side. We found also uh, a mirab on the side. And here maybe we can add some terraces. What is interesting here is that now that we know the building, we can make other comparison with other building. And I come back to this uh, Danestama building, uh, so-called madrasa. And here you see the, the layout is not exactly the same, but you have uh, this A1 in the entrance, the courtyard and the room around, the A1 in the axis of the entrance, and uh, the two square room on both sides. So my idea is that uh, the Roja Zabspush uh, so-called funerary complex is not, maybe not just a funerary complex, it's more probably a madrasa. And here we are in the, in the 12th century or maybe the 13th century. So this is one of the first examples the, in the region of such a kind of, of madrasa with, which, which we can find uh, later on in Iran or uh, in uh, Afghanistan and many other countries in, in the region. So just to, to finish, and I won't go uh, further, uh, let's come back to the, the role of the archaeology. So for me, if you want to restore a building before starting any restoration, any excavation to remove the dirt around, to cleaning, any cleaning around the monument, you have to call archaeologists. And even if archaeologists are not uh, conducting proper uh, excavation, you need to have an archaeologist on site following the work because you will, you will lose a lot of information. And after restoration, it's done, it's too late, so you lost information. And it's, it reminds me also uh, the presentation of yesterday uh, with the idea of bringing uh, architect students uh, on the site. It's very nice, but if you don't know what is the building, what do you teach to the students? Here people think we, we have a funerary complex, we have shrines. In fact, it's a madrasa. So what do you teach? If you just follow the general idea and don't have any proper study of the site, maybe you will teach wrong things to your students. So I'm just advocating for my, um, not my business, but my, my role as an archeologist. And this is really important because you will continue to, to tell the same thing again and again that people are saying for centuries, but it's maybe false. So you need specialists to, to work on the, on the site. And also very important is to keep this monument alive. Um, first, when uh, the, the building was restored, people start to put doors, lock the doors, and the community around was not able to, to enter anymore in the, in the shrines. There's a lot of disputes, lots of uh, protests around, and they reopen. And now people are continuing to use uh, the site, and they are keep taking care of the site. So you see, for example, here in uh, one of the rooms, a uh, woman um, built a small, uh, a small kitchen, and they are, they are doing some, um, let's say, religious cooking to, to bring the baraka on the families. Uh, they are still using this hole in the, in the wall, passing the newborn baby in the hole to bring in baraka again. And there's a lots of uh, ceremonies happening in this, in this funerary complex, in this cemetery. So if you close everything, okay, you have a nice building, but it's, it's uh, helpless. Uh, maybe you will have two or three tourists a year coming to the building, but people who are taking care of the building, uh, who are educated to, to take care of the building, they, they will be uh, left uh, aside. So I hope it will help. It's not about Macli, it's more about how we can work uh, on the medieval site or any other period. And thank you very much for, for listening. We will be uh, listening the thoughts of uh, Dr. Ruth Jung, uh, who will be talking about the role of heritage in communities with reference to Makli. Dr. Ruth Jung uh, is the first came, uh, she, she first came to uh, Leicester in 2000, the year 2000.